everyone. You are watching a brand new session, a live session from Hong Kong, where we learn from experts at the University of Hong Kong. Please tag your friends. Please hit share right now. We're live on Twitter, on Facebook. Please tag your friends so they can join us. Please hit share. Please hit retweet. This is a very important conversation on policy lessons from Asia with Professor Keiji Fukuda. Please do share this right now. Let's bring the whole world in. This is a global conversation. And we will take your questions using the hashtag AskHKUMed, hashtag AskHKUMed, and HKUCOVID19. Please hit share right now. Professor Keiji Fukuda is the director of the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. Please tag and share with the world. Hello, everyone. It's 9 p.m. in Hong Kong, 2 p.m. in London, and 9 a.m. right here in New York City. Welcome to this live global conversation about the COVID-19 pandemic. My name is Sri Srinivasan, and I'm the Marshall Loeb Visiting Professor of Digital Innovation at the Stony Brook School of Journalism. I'm honored to moderate this discussion brought to you by the University of Hong Kong. This is part of a series for all of us to learn lessons from what's happening in Hong Kong and Asia. We've spoken to various fields and uh, various experts in the fields of medicine, public health, and economics. Today, we're discussing policy lessons from Asia, and our guest is Professor Keiji Fukuda. He's director of the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong, and also a member of the expert advisory group at, that's advising the Hong Kong government on COVID-19 issues. Professor Fukuda was former assistant director general at the WHO, special advisor to the director general on pandemic influenza, and was director of the global influenza program. At WHO, Professor Fukuda led field investigations related to global outbreaks such as SARS, MERS, and Ebola. Before joining WHO, he worked at the US Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, and there he led field teams that assisted Hong Kong during the emergence of avian influenza in 1997 and has worked closely with China on issues such as influenza surveillance, SARS, and influenza 87N9. He's a physician and received his BA from Oberlin College, his MD from the University of Vermont, his MPH or Master in Public Health from the University of California at Berkeley, and his EIS training from the CDC. Please welcome Professor Fukuda. Hello, sir, how are you? Hi, Sri. Good. How are you? Thank you for being here. It's 9 a.m. in New York. We're just getting started. End of a long day for you. Tell us how you're feeling. What is happening in Hong Kong right now, Professor? Well, I'm feeling pretty good, and I'm delighted to be here and, uh, you know, excited about the discussion we'll have. In Hong Kong, you know, we're coming off, hopefully, the tail end of a surge in cases, and we're all keeping our fingers crossed that the cases cases will still stay low. But I think like everybody, you know, we are really looking forward to the day when the uh, outbreak will be over and we can get back to living life as we uh, hope to live it. But anyways, we're all doing fine here. Thank you, Professor. We also have some comments, people watching. I see Claire is watching from Turin and she says today's conversation is going to be a treat. Tell us where you're watching from. Please hit share, folks so that people around the world can join us. It's a real global conversation. Clara is in Milan in Italy, which of course, as we know, was the country that got a lot of attention uh, with what's happening, what was happening there. We have a chart that we're gonna show you that uh, kind of looks at where we are with the cases and, uh, and deaths around the world. I know today we crossed the 2 million mark, but this is from the FT, so let's bring that up. So. Uh, you can reflect on it. Uh, Professor, as you look at this chart, what are you thinking? What do you feel when you see these numbers? Well, I think it's interesting. You know, we've all been looking at these kinds of maps for the last few months, and I think the size of the dots have sort of shifted. And, uh, you know, 
a few months ago, we would have been looking at Asia. And now, you know, you can't help but be looking at Europe and North America as where the uh, heaviest activities are. Uh, so, uh, you know, this is what comes to mind right now. Sure, and we all often talk about flattening the curve. And so let's look at some of the curves that are uh, you know, shown on this map from around the world. Oh, this is the FT map that we recommend everybody check out daily. They put this out, uh, this graphic. Uh, what are we understanding from looking at this? Well, I think there's a couple of important things to pick out. One is that, uh, you know, if we look at the, uh, the line from China, you know, it should hearten us all that we can really bend the curve. It's not just talking about it. Uh, that it can be done. But I think that when we look to the uh, curves which are highest up, such as the US and Italy, um, you know, it really points out that in different parts of the world, uh, bending the curve is still not assured. And so I think, I hope it really pushes everybody to, to keep up their efforts. It's hard to do after so many weeks of, of really, you know, very difficult work, but we have to keep doing it. And we also have a chart that shows us what's happening in Hong Kong. Uh, what are your thoughts as you look at these numbers and what are, they, what are they telling us about Hong Kong itself? Yeah, I think that, you know, the curve is quite instructive and I think helpful for a lot of people to, to understand what's going on. If you look at that bottom curve there, which represents the cases which have been occurring in Hong Kong over the time, you can see that for the first uh, period of time, ranging from January up to, I don't know, mid the middle part of March, the number of cases were relatively low. And then you see that big surge in cases. And, uh, you know, at the time that that started, uh, I think everyone was wondering whether it was getting out of control in, in Hong Kong. And, you know, there was a similar surge of cases in other places like Singapore. But when you look at the colors, those blue colors are travelers. And what it really reflects is that as the pandemic has really become more active in all parts of the world, you know, in essence, people have wanted to go home. So most of those blue cases are people returning back to Hong Kong who have brought in infection. So in the last couple of weeks, about 75% of the cases have been related to travelers coming in from overseas. But um, it really, you know, you can understand that as things get more dicey overseas and people get worried, they, they want to go home. And so this is a challenge which is gonna be faced by everybody everywhere. Yeah, thank and, you. But it is coming down. And I think that it's coming down in part because, uh, you know, the, the reason for that curve going up has been studied by people in Hong Kong and the government has really taken action based on the information contained there. So very important to look at that. Yes, uh, folks, if you're watching right now, live or later, please follow HKU Med at HKU Med so that you can see all the latest information that they're tweeting out. We want people to have accurate timely information, and that's why we're doing this series of conversations. You're listening to a conversation with Professor Keiji Fukuda, who's the director of the School of Public Health. We wanted folks to get to know you a little bit, Professor. Uh, like me, you were born in Japan, and then you uh, moved to America, and you ended up studying at Oberlin, uh, a great liberal arts school in the, in the United States. Talk us, talk us through your career a little bit, and then we'll, we've got lots of questions coming in. People are tweeting us with hashtag AskHKUMed, hashtag AskHKUMed, and please follow HKUMed on Twitter. Professor. Uh, well, Sri, you know, I think you've actually lived in Japan longer than I have. My family moved to the States when I was a baby, and as you mentioned, I grew up there. Uh, but for whatever reason, and I grew up in a very Asian family growing up, uh, you know, I wanted to travel and see much of the world and my parents let me do it. I still don't understand why, but they did let me do it. And, uh, you know, so through my educational period, I did go see a number of different places, including Hong Kong. Now, this was back in the 70s. Um, but somehow my career has allowed me to keep traveling and it's been 
one of the re really big joys in my life. I've gotten to work with a lot of fantastic people in many countries around the world. And I continue to be able to do that by coming here to Hong Kong. And Hong Kong is uh, one of the cities that uh, I've really just uh, enjoyed the most in my life. So I'm, so I'm really glad to be here. We have connections into the US and of course colleagues at the CDC. How do you think the CDC has done through this crisis? Well, I think the CDC has had a tough time during this crisis. You know, the CDC, I, I see the CDC as one of the premier public health institutions in the world. It has a, a, a depth of expertise and history and experience that very few other organizations or institutions can match. But it did have some difficult times in the beginning with uh, some snafus on the testing. And then I think that it has not had as much of a prominent role uh, in the US as it normally would do in such a large outbreak. Nonetheless, I know my colleagues back there and they continue to do the work which needs to get done. So uh, they are applying, uh, you know, their epidemiologic and laboratory expertise and um, still doing the, the kinds of work that they've done with every major uh, outbreak which has occurred in our lifetime. And so, uh, so I think that there is still uh, working very hard on this. Uh, we have questions coming in from around the world and people are just telling us where they're watching from. So let's show you. We have folks watching from all over the world, including Mara's watching from Toronto. And we also saw Fred's watching from Bangkok. And I saw someone from Brooklyn, there's Cynthia. So this is that global connected interconnectedness. Linda's watching from Long Island. And Professor, that's part of why we're in the situation, right? This connection where people get on planes and they work in other countries and uh, goods and services are exchanged all over, right? Like that's why in part we're in this situation. Yeah, exactly. You know, in, in our lifetime three, one of the, if not the major factor shaping outbreaks has been globalization. And, you know, globalization is partly travel. It's partly the way we're connected, the, the way our economies are linked together. But uh, it's an interesting impact on outbreaks because it's both made it uh, easier for these infections to travel around the world more quickly, but it's also given us the capacity to be able to respond more quickly than ever. And so COVID, this current situation, like every other outbreak that I've been involved with in the past couple of decades, exemplifies both sides of that. You know, we're working on science in ways which were not possible in the past. There are collaborations which are occurring much faster than they would have occurred in the past. But uh, we're, we've also seen how quickly the fear of COVID, how quickly the infection itself has spread. And so you're right, this, this linkage, this interconnectedness is everything, it's both the threat side, but also our, our hopes for uh, getting through this as well as possible. Thank you. Well, we've got several questions coming in. What are your thoughts on the on the talk about the U.S. cutting funding to WHO? As we mentioned, you used to work there. You were a senior official. You were in field teams. You understand WHO and the World Health Organization better than most of us. What is their role and this threat which may come true from the president of the United States? Yeah, so this is the 800 pound gorilla in the uh, room, you know, for today. I think the, the news is really unwelcome for several different reasons. I think, you know, first, Sri, it's really important to know that one of the lessons of the past, and this goes back to, say, if we go back to the 1918 influenza pandemic, you know, Spanish flu. And every major outbreak since then has had one common lesson, which is that there is no country which can be an island in the face of, of large outbreaks like this. And that understanding has been the basis for some of the places that we've made the, the biggest breakthroughs in terms of uh, addressing pandemics. And so it was the basis for countries to adopt the international health regulations in 2005 it was the basis for initiating and 
successfully completing another framework called the Pandemic Influenza uh, Preparedness Framework. And it was also the basis for, the, for this idea called global health security, basically that countries need to work together when faced with a common threat. All of that requires a multilateral approach. And if you're going to have a multilateral approach, then you need an organization, which is WHO, to be at the center of that, uh, of that group of countries working together. And so the news uh, about potentially withdrawing the funding puts that at risk. The second thing is that all countries fundamentally depend on WHO, whether it's uh, visible or not, countries really need it. So big and rich countries like the US and China depend on WHO both to provide information and perspective, which they don't have on their own, but which is needed from the global community. Poor countries fundamentally depend on WHO for broader support, so policy support, guidance, but also uh, material support, having experts come in from different countries, sometimes having pharmaceuticals um, sent to them from the private sector and so on, all of which is usually coordinated by WHO. But the third aspect of it, which really struck me is that working, having worked in, in Geneva for a decade, you know, you really see that different countries have a different role to play in, in dealing with public health issues at the global level. And the U.S. has had a very important role in that. So if we think, if we think of things such as uh, the smallpox or polio eradication programs, uh, much of this was made possible because of the U.S.'s involvement in leadership and providing expertise and providing political backing and providing financial backing. And so it has really played an instrumental role in some of the most important uh, actions that have been taken at the global level in terms of health. And so the announcement really marks a stepping away from that. So whether President Trump actually follows through or not, it's a little bit like the announcement when the US was uh, indicated it would step away from the Paris Climate Agreement. It really sends a bad tremor through the international uh, community. And in the long term, it's going to weaken both the US, which fundamentally depends on other countries in terms of addressing health issues, but it's also going to fundamentally weaken the, the world's ability to deal with these complex issues. So I hope he doesn't follow through on it. It's really quite bad news. Um, we'll just have to see what happens. Thank you, Professor. It seems to me that in the middle of a global pandemic is not the time to cut funding to the most important organization dealing with global pandemics. Folks, you're watching a conversation with Professor Keiji Fukuda, who is the director of the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. We have hundreds of people watching now. There's so many people who would benefit from this conversation. Please share on Facebook, on, on Twitter, on YouTube, Tag your friends, hit share, hit retweet, and keep sending us questions and comments. We're using the hashtag AskHKUMed. You can also follow us on HKUMed. I'm at Sri, S-R-E-E -E, on Twitter. We wanna get your questions in, so please keep sending them along. Helen says, what do you think about herd immunity? How long would it take 70% of the Hong Kong population to get immune? So if you can just step back and peel Peel back that question of herd immunity. It's one of those things we hear about. People think they know what it means, but they don't really know what it means. Sure. So herd immunity is basically the idea that if enough people in a population get immunized or are, are immune against an infection, then it's just much harder for the infection to uh, basically move around and infect people who are not immune. And so basically, if the herd uh, you know, if, if the levels of immunity are high enough, everybody benefits from it. And the idea is sound. The, the question is, how do you achieve it? So in essence, there are only two ways to achieve herd immunity. Uh, the population gets infected and develops immunity uh, through the infection itself. And so that would basically mean having, uh, you know, COVID infections go through Hong Kong or, or different countries 
and infect uh, a significant number of people. So we don't know the exact percentage for this infection, but you know, most of the time modelers, for example, will assume it's going to be 60 or 70%, which is needed. The second way that this can happen, of course, is by vaccination. And so we have a number of companies working on vaccine development, although it's uh, not realistic to expect uh, to see the first of those vaccines until sometime next year. So I think that in a sense, we all would like to achieve levels of herd immunity and we would like to achieve it through vaccination. The problem with nat natural infection, of course, is that uh, with something like COVID, you can expect a lot of people to get very seriously ill. You can expect those seriously ill people to overwhelm hospitals. And you can also expect a lot of those people to die. So, um, you know, in Hong Kong, we very much do not want to achieve herd immunity uh, in an uncontrolled way, but really would like to uh, make it through until we're able to get a vaccine here. Thank you. We have so many questions and comments coming in. Let's go to this one. What is your prediction on a second wave in Asia, Singapore, Japan? We're seeing that already sort of happening in some places. So talk about that, please. Yeah, I, I think that... Uh, the way that I typically think about this issue is that how long are we going to be at risk for infection? You know, I think that we, it's nice to imagine waves rolling in and rolling out. And sometimes people talk about having a single wave and not, and, and hoping that we don't have additional waves, but that's really unlikely. And so in a place like Hong Kong, uh, you know, we have had low levels of infection for several different weeks. And then as uh, I mentioned early on, we then had a surge in cases, several hundreds of cases uh, over the past four or five weeks or so. And that surge in cases was uh, caused by a large number of people returning to Hong Kong with infection. That same shape curve could have been caused by other reasons. It could have been caused by outbreaks occurring solely within Hong Kong. So right now, as far as we know, most of the people in most countries remain susceptible to infection by COVID. And so it's quite likely that even countries like China, which have reduced their infection rates down to quite low levels, remain at high risk for seeing additional infections occur in the future. And so I think that um, all of the countries in Asia, but all countries elsewhere are going to be at risk for multiple waves of, uh, of infections occurring over the next several months. And so the bottom line is that given that picture the key things are to make sure that your surveillance systems, your monitoring systems are working as well as possible. And I think the most successful countries have really relied upon a lot of testing to help uh, assess what the true uh, situation is in the country. So yes, I do think that it's likely that we are going to see additional waves of infection. And the key things is key thing is, is that in knowing that, uh, make sure that we take the steps to uh, reduce the harmful impact of those additional waves in the future. You're listening to a conversation with Professor Keiji Fukuda, who's the director of the School of Public Health. We're so grateful to all of you for joining us. Please tag your friends, please hit share. Tell us where you're watching from. Tell us how you're feeling. And please follow at HKUMed on Twitter, and we're using the hashtag AskHKUMed. We have so many questions coming in, Professor. Let's see how many we can get through. Uh, Kalidas Girid says, what are the considerations for India's exit policy of lockdown? India has a population, as you know, 1.3 billion, and we should say, Professor, you, you're, you were born in Japan, you studied in the US, but as you said, noted, you went to India and did some research there, you went to Hong Kong. So you know India, uh, tell us about its approach and why is it, if I may add, that some of the countries where the regular other health outcomes and statistics are so poor, 
why are they you know doing pretty well on that chart we showed earlier in fact if we can pull up that chart again we can show you where india is we can show the audience that india in that chart with the curves is uh you know you can look on the screen in fact you have to look to find it because it is not as prominent but you can see it right above austria and ireland and india there's that little cluster there uh my instinct would be to imagine that india in health situations has you know worse outcomes than they're having at the moment well shri yeah a couple of uh thoughts on this uh well, one, when you look at those curves, let me just start there. You know, it depends on your capacity to do testing, to know really what your infection rates are and how many cases that you have. So that's one key consideration. And India is a very big country. The second thing is that, uh, you know, that the size of the population and the way the governance in, in India really does um, make it very challenging. Uh, you know, 1.3 billion people is a lot of people. Uh, in India, we have a federated governance system. You know, we have a, a central government, but we also have very strong uh, state governments. And in addition, in a place like uh, India, we have a number of different languages and cultures. And so in the many ways, it's a very complex country, more complex certainly than a place say like Hong Kong, which is geographically smaller and has fewer people. And I think that it's clear that if there are no efforts to try to reduce the spread of COVID within India, it could end up with a very large number of seriously ill people and people who have died. And I think that right now we appear to be just at the you know early parts of the outbreak in in India, but the cases are beginning to increase uh, rapidly. And as you know, from exponential curves, they look like they start out slowly, but they can pick up speed very quickly. And so I think that, um, you know, the, the options for, for India are, are difficult. Currently, it's in a state of lockdown. And it's possible to do that for a short period of time, but how long that can be extended in in India, I think, is a is a very real question. And my sense is that uh, it's going to probably be difficult to treat India as a single entity in terms of uh, trying to exit from some of those control measures. And that it may have to be done more or less on a state-by-state -state approach. In many ways, that is not optimal. It would be because uh, you can have people traveling from one place to another, depending on what the control measures are. But again, given the complexity and size of India, it may be the only realistic option that it has. Thank you, Professor. We're just looking through all the comments that are coming in let's uh, do a shout out to the folks who are watching i'll name the countries they're watching and you'll tell us if you've been there or the states uh, uh we have somebody watching from michigan i'm sure you've been uh, sure uh how about scotland no never been to scotland all right we have to fix that right one of the things i'm trying to do is trying to think of where i will go after this is we're allowed to travel again because i think People want to travel when they can, and it's it's something. We have somebody watching from the Upper West Side, right in my neighborhood. You've you've been to New York, of course, and spent time yeah. here. <laughs> New York's one of my favorite cities. It's I'm very fond. Of it. Yeah, and it's you know you you know what's happening here. We feel like we're the epicenter of the epicenter, and uh, we, we'll have some questions about that coming through as well. So, folks, keep telling us where you're watching from. We have someone watching from Kowloon, right there in Hong Kong. So that's really nice. Where are you right now? Uh, I am in my office. And and where is that situated so that people get a sense? So uh, the uh, Hong Kong University's uh, medicine faculty and the School of Public Health are located on the western southern part of the island. So we are in an area called Pokfulam, 
Uh, and if I look out my window in the daytime, it's too dark now, I can see the ocean. So very nice view from here. Oh, that's, that's, that's terrific. Okay, here's a question from Andy on Facebook. And remember, we're on all the platforms, folks. So please share your questions. Tell us where you're watching from. We love seeing that. There's research from Harvard published in the academic journal Science that intermittent lockdown measures may have been imposed, may have to be imposed till 2022. What do you think about that? And just generally, are you in the prognostication business? Do you try to make predictions or do you, or how do you approach questions like this? And also this particular research, if you are familiar with it. Um, well, uh, let me try to take some of these. Uh, no, I'm not in the prognostication business and I try to usually be as clever as I can to escape making any kind of predictions. Um, but I think that the general idea that it will be necessary both to respond to the current situation by um, establishing uh, control measures and then backing away from them when activity levels go down is, uh, is realistic. You know, I think that uh, the colleagues in Harvard have been also in working with some of the people from the, uh, the school here and the university. And I think this idea of both suppressing and lifting um, over time and until we are able to vaccinate a large part of the population uh, is, uh, is realistic. And it's in essence what we're practicing here in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, uh, you know, we started out with certain control measures the activity was relatively low. And then when there was a surge in cases, uh, the social distancing measures and the border control measures were stepped up. But I think they're, now that the cases are coming down and they have been down in the single digits for the last uh, you know, number of days, uh, you know, hopefully we can begin to lift some of those social distancing measures and so people can be uh, more, uh, you know, back to a more normal level of activity. But we also very much recognize that if there is another surge in cases for whatever reason, then that it may also be important to or necessary to reestablish stronger social distancing measures. And so I think that this is kind of the idea of uh, uh, suppressing and, and relaxing uh, control measures. Thank you, Professor. We have comments, uh, more comments, people watching from, again, Scotland. We have someone who is watching from Eastern India in West Bengal. Uh, we have Vancouver. Uh, you've been to all of these places, I'm sure. But we're also seeing, Professor, on, our, on, on social media, people saying vaccines are fake, uh, you know, being these trolling kind of comments and questions. What, how do you combat this kind of misinformation, disinformation? that sometimes comes from unexpected places. We have seen medic medicines being recommended at the highest levels in some places. So can you talk about that, please? And then we have lots more questions coming in. I think that in global public health, but it's now much more generalized, how to deal with misinformation has been one of the most difficult and really still unsolved problems. To be blunt, we don't really quite know how to counter um, all the misinformation out there. And as you know, it can come from highest levels. It can come from unnamed sources on the uh, internet, and it can come in many different ways. This particular instance uh, of vaccines, you know, this has been the subject of a huge amount of uh, misinformation for decades. You know, there have been uh, really strong efforts made to uh, downplay, discredit um, the importance of vaccination when in fact it has been really one of the major breakthroughs in public health history, the ability to protect people before they get infected. And I think that this kind of situation really requires uh, authoritative um, sources of information. And so these can be well-established individuals, these can be well-established organizations to really be quite active in terms of uh, communicating what is truthful information and factual information and trying to counter, uh, you know, uh, misinformation or 
um, untruths when they're encountered. But it is a very difficult job. And I think that some of the rumors that I hear about, and uh, you know, oftentimes they have to do with vaccines, are the same rumors that have come up during other outbreaks. You know, during the 2009 uh, influenza pandemic outbreak, there was a lot of uh, misinformation about uh, how this, these were uh, vaccines intended, for example, to harm people in different countries or were not uh, suitable for, uh, for various reasons. And I won't go into all of them, but it really is a, a, a common issue. And I think that uh, we still don't really know how to deal so effectively with it. Thank you, Professor. We have comments coming in from Malaysia to Indonesia to Denmark. So people are watching from all over the world. Folks, we have about 20 minutes or so with the professor. So get your comments in, get your questions in. If we don't get them all in, you know that we're following the hashtag at uh, uh, the hashtag AskHKUMed and at HKUMed. Please keep sending us the questions because we know these questions will continue to be important. Here's a question from Kizito Myra, who says, we are hearing cases of those testing positive, yet they were discharged from hospitals after being treated, and they were negative in some countries. So there is this confusion. Some people seem to go home and then after being recovered and then pass away. Some people, it seems like they have it again after being negative. How is that possible? And doesn't that confuse everything? Yeah, it is confusing and it's a situation, it's a question which has come up a lot. And, uh, you know, not so long ago, there are a lot of questions about whether people were getting reinfected um, after, uh, you know, apparently uh, becoming, uh, getting over their illness. And, you know, I think that the likelihood that there's real reinfection going on remains pretty low. However, it's not zero. You know, there are uh, studies which have come out showing that even when you have a, a measurable antibody response, your levels of neutralizing antibody can be quite low. And so whether that equates to uh, having uh, uh, less immunity, you know, remains to be uh, resolved right now. But there are questions like that. And it's also clear that uh, some people can remain uh, antigen positive for longer than, uh, you know, other people. Whether that equates into them being infectious is another question. And so I think that, uh, you know, when people appear that they're better, but they remain uh, antigen positive, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, there may sometimes be testing errors, but I think the issue is right now there probably are people who remain antigen positive for longer than the majority of people. And again, whether they are infectious or not um, is, an, is another question. And this is something that we will have to keep a close eye on, especially as these cases keep accumulating. Um, Miji707947, in a post-lockdown scenario, what is the way to protect seniors? Well, I think, you know, the, the basic idea for protecting seniors, whether we're post lockdown or in a lockdown is, is very similar. I mean, in, in essence, we know that the elderly are the group of people who in general are at highest risk for developing serious uh, uh, disease and for dying from, from COVID. And so without having vaccine, the basic idea is that we want to keep uh, these people as shielded from infections as, in as much as is uh, possible. And so in a post-lockdown period, still not going out and mixing with large numbers of people um, is prudent. I think a number of the uh, public health or personal health measures which have been recommended, you know, if you go out, uh, wear a mask, uh, if you are touching things, uh, you know, to make sure that you are washing your hands um, frequently, these kinds of uh, steps are important. And then for friends and family members, if you are sick and it's possible that you could have COVID or in fact another infection, 
then staying away from uh, you know, your, your elderly relatives or friends is also an important step for protecting them. So these are things that uh, you know, one would recommend whether we're in a lockdown period or whether uh, we're in a post-lockdown period. Thank you, Professor. Folks, we have Professor Keiji Fukuda with us. Please share your questions. Tell us where you're watching from. We're on Facebook and Twitter. We want to hear from you. KF, uh, CF Kwan asks, Professor, what would you see the trend of public health research and prevention of another pandemic post COVID-19? Where is all this going, Professor? And in an additional question, do you think this is going to spark more interest in the public health fields, in medicine? Is there going to be more interest or are some people going to be worried as we're seeing healthcare workers in some countries are 10, 15, 20% of the cases, like in the Netherlands, 25% of the cases are healthcare workers. You know, Sri, I think that COVID is going to change things in ways that we can't imagine right now. In many ways, I think that uh, the questions raised by COVID is not only going to stimulate discussion and interest in how do we protect ourselves better against future pandemics, which are going to occur for sure, um, but also they're going to raise a number of other questions beyond that. You know, are we going to uh, continue to have a multilateral approach to addressing crises? What does this mean in terms of governance? You know, we've seen that a number of different uh, countries with different forms of government have handled the uh, response to the outbreak differently. Uh, we have seen that different uh, measures such as uh, electronic monitoring of individuals are being used in a number of different countries in a sense. Uh, you know, this is becoming a little bit normalized. So there are profound changes going on. And I think that in terms of research, uh, beyond understanding the impact of the disease and understanding characteristics about the virus and the epidemiology and so on, I think that we are going to profound, profoundly have to relook at what is the relationship between uh, governance and culture and responding to these kinds of crisis situations. Um, and uh, so I expect that this is going to lead to quite an explosion in research beyond uh, any other kinds of outbreaks that we have seen in our lifetime. I hope, I hope it really brings us also to rethink through uh, health systems. And uh, we have seen that in the countries which have generally done the best, and I consider many of the countries in Asia to have done well so far, we have seen that a common denominator has been that they have had uh, unified single payer health systems and countries which have struggled the most have had fragmented systems. And so I hope we have a, a generation of people that works towards improving those health systems, taking what we've learned from this current outbreak, applying it. And, uh, you know, and I desperately hope this outbreak does not scare people about going into health, but uh, really, if anything, galvanizes them because I, I hope it shows the central importance of health to virtually all aspects of uh, societal well-being. So really, I can't see where all of this is going to go, but I do believe that this is really the beginning of a, of a quite profound evaluation of virtually everything. Wow, that is, that's, that's, you know, in some ways, it's good to know that there is a way to look at this, but it's also daunting considering how much fragmentation there is in the world. If we can just pull up again the chart that shows the curves, because we have a question about South Korea, Professor, and in that chart with this curves, we see that China is doing really well, and Korea never even went up as high as it could have, and it stayed that look at that line. What does that line tell us about Korea and the work that they have been able to do to make sure that curve stays where it is? Well, if we Go to Korea, as, as you remember, you know, Korea really started off with a bang. There was a big outbreak of cases in the city of Daegu, 
and that and uh, you know many of those cases were related to a cluster and so it got off on a uh, you know it started off with a big explosion of cases um, but what the South Koreans were able to do was apply many of the things that they learned from previous outbreaks. So I'm thinking of uh, when MERS and the MERS outbreak occurred in uh, Seoul in 2015, which also took uh, Korea by surprise. What they did after that was to improve the public health system. So they made things like the Korea CDC um, more robust and stronger and took other steps to improve the, the public health system. And you can see the benefits of that now. They learned how to do contact tracing, how to do case investigations better. They really applied that. And then they took their technological expertise and really used it to uh, use testing at a very high degree. And that strategy paid off for them in both uh, being able to monitor and to assess their situation very well. And these are some of the common elements that were used by uh, you know, South Korea to flatten the curve, if anything. And again, some of the other key elements that they had there is that they had uh, good leadership, they had good communications with the public explaining things pretty clearly to them. And so, some of these are common elements to many of the countries in Asia. Uh, and you know, each of these countries has sort of put together their recipe for dealing with COVID a little bit differently, but there are some common elements. But I think that looking at uh, the lessons from Korea, it's very useful for other countries in terms of uh, determining what might be uh, employed in their own countries. Thank you, Professor. We have a few minutes left with Professor Keiji Fukuda, who's the Director of Public Health at the School of, at the School of Public Health in the, at the University of Hong Kong. And he has worked at the WHO, worked at the CDC, has led field teams into studies of uh, outbreaks such as uh, SARS and MERS and Ebola. So he is really one of the world's top experts and we're so grateful to have him here. Lina Santos asks, what studies have been made to determine how the virus will behave at high temperature or tropical countries? And Lena's watching from the Philippines. Well, there's been both uh, some, uh, you know, studies done under controlled methods, you know, and some of those have been done by uh, investigators at uh, Hong Kong University in our school here. And then there have been some other attempts to look at uh, the survival and behavior of of this virus uh, under more natural conditions. And, uh, you know, if you look at the laboratory studies, for example, uh, you know, when the temperature goes up, when humidity goes up, and depending on the surface, uh, you know, the survival of the virus uh, goes down. But under cool conditions and drier conditions, you know, the virus can be quite robust. Uh, in terms of surviving in the environment and by robust, uh, you know, surviving for days. Uh, I think that the studies on natural uh, infections, though, are not exactly the same as the laboratory studies. The laboratory studies, you know, use things such as viruses in uh, transport media, for example, whereas in the real world, the viruses are not going to be in trans, uh, transport media. And there, you know, of course, there's been much speculation as to whether uh, virus activity is going to be lower in, in the summer months or in the warmer months. But again, we have seen that, uh, you know, the activity of the virus can be quite, quite active in places like uh, Australia, in warmer climates like Singapore. And so I think that we don't have uh, any evidence that this virus cannot be highly infectious in warmer climates. It may be that it develops a seasonal pattern, but right now we're in a situation where the majority of people, the vast majority of people in the world are uh, susceptible to infection. And that probably is a strong enough factor right now to make sure that we'll continue to see activity regardless of seasonality. 
It may be in the future, like many other respiratory viruses, it settles into more of a seasonal picture, but we'll, you know, we'll need a couple of years to see whether that's true or not. Thank you, Professor. We have just a few minutes left, so we're going to do quick questions and quick answers. The debate in the U.S. about reopening the country or the economy, what kind of preparations are needed before reopening? Uh, can you share the experiences from Asia? Yeah, I think that, you know, again, the U.S., like uh, India, is a large country. It has a lot of different uh, cultures within the country, and it has uh, a political system which is both federated to a certain extent and centralized to a certain extent. Given that situation, I think there are some clear um, things that you want as you, as you try to normalize activity. One of them is you want leadership at all levels, which is unified. You want clear messaging going out to people so they are not confused. You want to have a surveillance system which is able to actually monitor um, accurately what is going on. And so this, uh, you know, the U.S. is greatly increase its testing capacity, but it can increase its testing capacity even more. And you need those uh, sorts of um, capacities to be exerted. But I think fundamentally the question for all countries in terms of policy is, what is the balance that they will accept in terms of having disease control versus normalizing economic and societal activity? And choosing that is, uh, not a science question. It's really what is it that is acceptable in that country? And that's going to vary from country to country. And the second issue for countries is that uh, once you have an idea of what you're willing to accept in terms of trade off and that balance, is what are the means that you're willing to use to achieve that balance? And so, uh, you know, are you willing to use extensive testing? Are you willing to use extensive monitoring? Um, and so on, in terms of uh, going back to a more normalized level of activity. So the US has all the technical capacity in the world that it needs. I think um, it, it's missing, uh, right now it is not on the same page in terms of being consistent with its messaging and I think that these are some of the things which are going to be needed in the U.S. before it can really move back optimally to uh, normalizing activities. Thank you, Doctor uh, and Professor. We have so many questions and comments coming in, including uh, folks who are quoting you, and you, especially when you said, "No man of no country is an island," and therefore you have to really think in that kind of global sense. We have lots of comments here. We also want to ask you a question about travel. Uh, Mr. Au asks, what would be the normal for coming years concerning travel before the world's population is immunized with the vaccine? And also, what percentage of the world needs to be immunized, uh, have a vaccine, needs to be vaccinated before it would be considered that it's taken effect? Okay, well, so this is a complicated question. I think that in terms of a crisis situation like COVID, uh, you know, there's both the crisis aspect of it, which is really the, uh, you know, the emotional and the uh, urgent part of it. And then there's the actual disease control of the infection. And they're not necessarily the same thing. So that's one thing to understand. I think that as soon as we start getting vaccine coming out, even if, uh, the amounts are not enough to vaccinate some billions of people. Uh, that will do a lot towards uh, really relieving much of the tension in the world and, and uh, restoring, uh, you know, economies back and, and, and restoring confidence. Um, in terms of uh, how much of the population we want to uh, vaccinate, you know, Again, presumably, we're going to want to have a, a world which is relatively immune to COVID. So this is going to mean vaccinating some billions of people. Uh, you know, right now we're over 7 billion people now, so perhaps 3 or 4 billion people is where uh, hopefully we can get to over the next, say, 4 or 5 years. And then 
in terms of travel before we have vaccine, you know, I, this is going to push everybody to uh, make a decision if they're going to travel for a holiday uh, and there are not vaccines available, well, how much is it worth it to them to travel somewhere versus the risk of getting infected? And that's going to be a person by person choice. And the same thing is going to uh, exist for businesses. You know, right now, businesses have uh, really expanded their operations so that they're communicating by electronic means. Will they prefer to do that or would they prefer to have face-to-face -face meetings um, when before vaccines are available? So uh, again, I don't have a crystal ball about how people are going to decide about these things, but these are some of the issues that people will face uh, in deciding about whether to travel or not. Thank, thank you, Professor. We have just a couple of minutes left. I'm just going to read you uh, maybe a couple of questions and then you can uh, synthesize them together. Winnie Mary is watching from London and she says, we have strong resistance from UK scientists and medical advisors for preventive measures such as mask wearing. They argue that if you wear a mask, you can't drink tea. People feel too insecure or too secure and touch their face and uh, the virus may drive the 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 mask may drive the virus inside the mask. All of this stuff is, I think there's a fundamental East Asia and American and maybe UK also division on this, right? Like I think in East Asia, you wear a mask, it's sign of politeness because you don't want other people to get sick. In America, if you wear a mask, people like, even today, even as much as there is masks, uh, there are masks being used, you see people kind of uh, think that there's a problem if you're wearing a mask. Can you talk about that since you've lived in both cultures? Yeah, you know, probably I can't think of anything more in global public health that I've been involved with, uh, with which has divided people so much as masks. And this is going back before COVID. And there is something deeply cultural about masks. Um, you know, the scientific, I would say that the scientific scientific evidence now is weighted in favor of wearing masks. I think a, a while ago, I would have said it was really more neutral, um, but it is not uh, weighted so much that you can simply say that wearing masks is going to be the answer for preventing infections. It's one part of many other steps that you need to be taking to reducing infections. But in Asia and uh, you know, in Hong Kong, yes, we wear masks pretty commonly for the reasons that you cited. One, we believe that it uh, reduces infections and reduces the likelihood of infection. Two, I think it's a signal to other people that you are concerned about their health and so on. And there's something um, culturally supportive about that. And I think that uh, these are important aspects of, uh, of how we behave when we're in a crisis situation. And three, it is very clear with COVID that uh, there are a significant number of people who can be infected, who don't have symptoms, but could be exposing other people to virus. And here, the evidence is quite strong that wearing masks can be helpful. So I think that, uh, you know, the culture and the, the culture of wearing masks is apt to change slowly. Culture is never anything which cha uh, never changes overnight. But I think that um, the example set by Asian countries is probably being noted by uh, many other populations. And so there are many people in the West who are now beginning to wear masks on a regular basis. And so I think that this is one of the places where we may end up seeing uh, significant change on the basis of the COVID experience. Thank you. Let's go with this as the last question for now. And we're so grateful to you, Professor, for being with us. How are you preparing the next batch of medical and public health students in light of COVID-19 at the University of Hong Kong? How, are the, how is the education impacted? And, and what is going to happen going forward? How are international students going to be treated, not just at the University of Hong Kong? How do students in China or India or Australia decide to get on a plane and go to America this fall as you know, when the semesters start? Well, COVID has had a major disrupting effect on education in Hong Kong. Uh, in the first place, uh, you know, many of the schools, including the universities, have been uh, shut down without face-to-face uh, -face classes for some months now. 
And what this has led to is uh, moving many of the classes onto electronic platforms. And so uh, we have really accelerated that process uh, and so that has probably been the major adaptation. We've tried to continue uh, courses, um, keeping them on schedule as much as possible, um, but really moving the teaching. So tutoring is uh, done online. Uh, small group discussions can be done online. Um, and uh, making those kinds of adaptations. Uh, it has been uh, difficult for students who are overseas to return. Um, uh, because travel is so disrupted. And, uh, but on the, on the plus side, you know, COVID also has opened up research opportunities. And so we've tried to make those opportunities as available as possible to students who are interested in uh, researching some aspect of COVID. So at least taking advantage of the, of the situation. Uh, but, uh, you know, I think uh, the bottom line is that we are all hoping for the day when we can go back to having face-to-face -face classes. I think that uh, it's nice to do a lot of the teaching online, but it's also very nice to see people in a class and just to be able to talk with them. So, oh, uh, Professor, uh, one of the things that I will um, ask you to kind of reflect on as we say goodbye here is uh, where, where do you think we go from this? What are the immediate and then long-term things we should all be thinking about? Kind of your final words for now. I think that in the immediate, hopefully we all have seen that when we're in a crisis situation, you know, you really depend on other people. You depend on your family, you depend on your friends, you depend on your colleagues. And in many ways, COVID has conspired to keep us separate. You know, we have uh, tried to employ social distancing uh, and, uh, you know, successfully done those kinds of things. But at the same time, I think for many of us, it is really deeply underscored how much we are connected and care about other people. And I think that is an incredibly valuable thing which COVID has given to us. Because we, we do live in a kind of 24 seven world and particularly in a very busy place like Hong Kong. And so I think it has underscored the importance of those connections that we have each other. In the long run, I do think some of the issues which I mentioned earlier are very germane. COVID somehow has exposed that we are vulnerable in many different ways, that how we did business in the, in the past um, is not necessarily the best way for doing business in the future. And we are going to really fundamentally have to rethink through a lot of things about how we live in society. And I think that uh, this will take a while to sort through, but I do hope that uh, in this globalized world, we get the contribution from everybody about this, because I do think that, um, you know, the world tomorrow is not going to be the same as before COVID. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. It's 10 p.m., past 10 p.m. in Hong Kong. You've had a long day. We're so grateful to you. Uh, I'm just going to reintroduce you because we have people catching up at the end of this segment, and then they'll watch the replay. They, we want them to go back and watch the replay. So you don't see this on television where you reintroduce the person at the very end, but I'm gonna do this because that's one of the things we've learned about this new way of communicating. We want people to go back and watch the show. So our guest in this series from the University of Hong Kong so that we can learn from around the world is Professor Keiji Fukuda, who is the director of the School of Public Health at the University of Hong Kong. He's also a member of the expert advisory group that advises the Hong Kong government on the COVID-19 epidemic. He's a former assistant general, general, director general of the WHO and a special advisor to the director general on pandemic influenza and also a director of the global influenza program. And we should note that the director has said today in response to the confusion around uh, President Trump's statements that they are focused, WHO is on tackling COVID-19 and is not gonna be distracted on other issues. 
at WHO, Dr. Dr. Fukuda also led field investigations related to SARS, MERS, and Ebola. And he's a physician, and he studied at Oberlin, uh, the University of Vermont, California, Berkeley, and at the CDC. So he's had so much global experience, one of the top experts on pandemics, and this pandemic in particular. Professor, I'm so grateful. Thank you on behalf of people watching around the world. It's been great to have you with us. We're so, so thankful to you and to your colleagues for sharing useful, accurate information. And for everybody watching, please follow at HKUMed, and please keep sending your questions with the hashtag AskHKUMed. And my name is Sri Srinivasan. I am a professor of digital innovation at the university, at Stony Brook University School of Journalism, and I'm just very grateful to have this opportunity to meet a fellow Tokyo-born uh, professor. He was born in Tokyo, as was I. He now lives in Hong Kong. He's an American in Hong Kong, and I'm an American here in New York City. Two great cities of the world connected at this terrible time, but we're going to emerge stronger. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Have a good morning. Good morning and good night. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Wow. <laughs>